Well, welcome everyone to the ninth session in the Trellis Seminar Series 2021. For those of you who don't know us, Trellis is the charity that supports therapeutic gardening in Scotland with over 480 groups in the network. We provide information, training and good practice sharing. And we aim to promote the highest quality of gardening services and enable everyone to get the best out of them. For links to all our resources online, please see the Trellis homepage. The session today is approximately 60 minutes long and it will comprise of a presentation and then a Q&A session. Please use the chat feature throughout the session to ask questions and then Joan will voice the questions to our presenter at the end of the presentation. During the presentation, um, you can move your Zoom thumbnails to the side to see the slides um, more clearly. Just click and drag and minimise them. So today, it's a real privilege to welcome our speaker, Chris Campbell. Um, Chris is going to talk about important social spaces and um, featuring Gervin Community Garden and how important these spaces have become during this COVID year. Chris is the manager of Gervin Community Garden, which is situated within a former walled garden at the bottom of a narrow winding lane in the harbour area of Gervin in South Ayrshire. They pride themselves on the promotion of green tourism, organic gardening and upcycling to members of the local community and to visitors in the area. Chris's presentation will focus on the challenges presented to charitable organisations by the COVID restrictions, how to adapt and how to emerge from the pandemic as a stronger organisation. So I'll pass you now over to Chris, who will share his screen and his presentation with you. Hello, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, OK, I'm going to just share my screen first uh, and I'll just talk a wee bit before I actually start uh, going through the slides. OK. And, yeah. OK, everybody see that? Yes, we can. Thank you. OK, that's good. So um, garden, gardening and, and gardening space is, is different. Uh, it's different a year on from where it was a year ago. Um, we are becoming a valuable asset to communities. Um, anyone that's associated with even an allotment uh, or a community garden or anything that involves an outdoor space where people were gathering before, but not necessarily gathering all together, you know, but gathering in some form of social uh, contact. So my presentation today is about um, the struggle almost, uh, the, the, the initial struggle of the government saying, you need to close your outdoor space. So you have to close an outdoor space that is your, your heart and soul of your operation. Everything you do is focused on your outdoor space and they tell you to close it. So lots and lots of uh, different organizations that are, that I, like I say, either allotment groups or uh, community gardens or even just green spaces that are managed by different groups, uh, weren't able to go out and do that. And it had a massive impact on us all. Uh, and then when they opened it up again in July, uh, it, it, it was like a breathe, it was like being able to breathe again and, you know, get people back in um, and, and start this new way of engaging again. And I think things have changed since July when we opened up again. Uh, I think that the way that we have to manage our outdoor space has made it different. So today, uh, that's the, my focus today is to look at how we have, we actually have outdoor spaces in, a, in our different community gardens. Uh, or if you're aspiring to have a community garden for the future, uh, or you have an outdoor space, we, you just have to think a bit more about how you plan the build and the development of that. So we've been, we've been very fortunate down at the community garden in Girvan because we had been developing, and, you, and you'll see this in the slides, we have been developing our outdoor space to accommodate community events, and they have to be flexible. So they have to be able to be a workshop or a workspace 
uh, one day and then be a gathering cafe, so to speak, for in another day. So it's about adapting uh, spaces so that they can be two or three different things. And that's what's going to be important going forward because people are going to be reasonably reluctant to go out and gather in the indoor situations very quickly, but they may be more uh, ready to, to come into an outdoor space uh, because it's outdoors and, and it feels a bit easier than, than being masked up indoors and two metres apart. Okay, so I'm going to start anyway. I've got a few uh, slides on, it's nothing fancy. It's just a, a wee idea of showing you um, what, what we've created and uh, how we've adapted a little, all right? So first slide, I'm opening up with a biggie. <laughs> so this is a, this is a 10,000 pounds uh, geodesic dome which, I mean, if you're going to go for a bit of funding and you want a structure and you've got a good secure, a secure garden, uh, go for this beastie. It's fantastic. It is, uh, it can handle 80 mile an hour plus winds and I've been in it with an 80 mile an hour winds. It can handle the winds and it is great. It comes with a wood burning stove. Everything's in it. It's fantastic. It really is. And it's a great space. It's seven and a half meters in diameter. Can, I would say pre-COVID it could have held about 30 people, but uh, now that we're in this more uh, sort of uh, spread out situation, you, we would really not put more than 15 in there, but you could put 15 to 16 and be two meters apart, no problem. So that's the that's our geodesic dome, and that's, it's become our feature, but we've not been able to use it yet, but that's coming. So bubbles. These aren't the bubbles that you blow out the wee fairy liquid thing. These are our social bubbles. And for a, a period of time this summer, uh, we're still going to have to operate in a form of social bubble. So it's just, you know, from tomorrow, it'll be four people in from two households. By the end of the month, it'll be six people from two households. And, and I really, I think the next transition after that will be just anyone. So the way we're looking at it is you, you and your organization control the bubbles. So you have to advise people when they come into your unit, you know, if they're coming into the garden or if they're coming into an allotment space, these are the sizes of the bubbles that, we, that you can have in, in any one place within the garden. So you could technically have someone sitting on a table somewhere Two meters apart, another wee bubble, you know, and then and then two meters apart, another wee bubble. And people, I find the people that we get coming into the garden are pretty responsive to that. They come in and they they go along with uh, the situation because they're just so happy to be back out again and be back out amongst people, but be safely back out amongst people. So the bubbles are really important. And if they come into the to your your place and they know that you are given good instruction on on the, the social situation, they feel in good hands. So it's going to be very important, the bubble situation. Uh, and I can't wait until it gets to the point where there's no meterage distance and we're back to inverted commas normal. Okay, so when I'm talking about adapting outdoor spaces, you, we originally had a cabin and we felt that when we had our normal Scottish weather, uh, there was a lack of workshop space. So we wanted to create a covered space that we could use for a kind of workshop area or, you know, planting up or doing different things, even for paint, painting benches. So uh, we, if you look at the structure there in the corner, you can see uh, a, a kind of a, a corrugated plastic on the top. So you want the light to come through uh, and it's, it's reasonably easy to fit. Uh, and a nice simple timber structure. We used a couple of local guys who had joinery as a hobby, not necess necessarily joiners, and we paid them to come in and do it, and they gave us a great rate, and uh, we bought the materials in, and they built this uh, extension. And then once it was built, we had the idea that there was days when it was freezing in there, so we thought, wouldn't it be good if we could put sides on it? So we got these PVC sides, and 
they come with studs, and again, they're very, very good in our in our wind. We get a lot of wind in Girvan, and uh, they handle it no problem. So it takes away when you, when you then take the wind away, you you've creating that shelter space. Now, if we look at the COVID situation, they want a flow of air. So up above the the last, if you look at the middle sheet there with a window in it, there's a, there's an eave, and the eave is open, so that there's always a flow of air coming in through. So it's still an outdoor space. So although it's potentially, it looks like it's an indoor space, it's not. It's an outdoor space with a constant flow of air going through it, through it. which means that people, you can have two people, you know, a, a bubble sitting over on that side, and you can create the same bubble over here. So you're creating spaces for, where people can actually socially gather, but feel safe about it. And that's that's a wonderful wee space that, um, in it, but it, we, we use it for quite a lot of things. If we're if we're doing, uh, if we're doing like a, a buffet or something like that, we we can serve out of the hatch, and, and and everything can be out there, you know, without actually again having a contact with people. So that's an important one, and the cost is something like that, you know, to build the the, the timber frame, the corrugated plastic, about two thousand pound, and that includes labour. So. That's an important one. Again, you, if you're looking at funding, then these are these are really good uh, sort of small pockets of funding to go for. Uh, and, and you could, you know, if, if you're generating two or three thousand uh, pounds, then you could you could get a wee thing like that. That's the other side. And just now it, it looks a bit bare. That was taken in the winter time. Um, but again, we would create a wee bubble over this side, you know, for up to, you know, when it comes to it. We're not going to open until the 29th of March, but we're talking about six, a wee space for six people to gather, like a wee family. So, and there's the window that we open up and become it becomes a serving hatch. So, wonderful uh, wee space, uh, very adaptable, you know, in this, in the very odd occasion, and it has happened, you know, in the very odd occasion when it's roasting hot in Scotland, what we do is we roll those PVC sides up and, the, and you see the straps hanging down, they're buckles and they just up it goes and then you've got a complete flow of air coming through for those very rare continental days. Okay, next one. So this is a, I keep, I keep wanting to say a pagoda, but it's not, it's a pergola. And it was originally, you know, built like, like you would build a pergola, like a timber frame, and it was just left like that as a timber frame, and we started pl putting plants growing up it. But we very quickly realised it was an important wee space. It, we we trans this this wee space becomes our stage when we have music events. Uh, and if what we did to to make it the stage, we put the corrugated uh, plastic that was left over from the the other the other structure. We put that on the roof there, and we made it watertight on the, on the roof. And then we thought, let's gather the water. <laughs> so the, you'll see the wee rowing pipe goes along to two water butts that gather water. And uh, again, the PVC, P PVC sides come in. So even in the, on the worst day you can possibly get, that's actually quite a nice space. You see that funny contraption there at the, in the foreground? Uh, that is a gas canister, pardon me, that's been uh, converted by a welder into a wood burner. And we've put an aluminium chimney on it. it. That's not actually where it sits. It would be sitting. You'd probably bring it a meter back this, you know, towards the outside, because that's an open side there. Uh, so a meter back this way, and then because the chimney's going out the back, your fire and your heat can be almost on the edge, coming into your outdoor space, and your smoke is going elsewhere. So uh, that's a, an interesting wee contraption, and it's mobile, so you can move it about all over the place. And you can take the big chimney off it, it just slides over a smaller chimney, so you can use it as an outdoor barbecue as well. Great wee, great wee structures, uh, I love meeting people that can do things and then commissioning them to do it. So, simple things here, uh, our greenhouse is a very warm space, so uh, if you think about uh, the winter months, you know, normally that greenhouse has got lots of tomatoes and peppers and things like that in it. But in, in, as we come out of the growing season, you've got a greenhouse for six months that's not doing anything. You can do cuttings and things if you're doing all that. We, we do that over on the other side, the, the shelving side. But potentially that becomes another wee space that you can actually have a wee table with chairs and things, you know, so that people can actually sit and they're out of the, the, the bad weather, you know. You don't want to be in there on a hot day or even in a warm day. 
Uh, but anyway, unless you're wanting to lose a lot of weight. So um, next one is uh, our latest development, which is a lean to this space, or the space on the right hand side that you just can't see no more. It was is a compost area. It's like three or four compost sections, one we use to store wood. Um, and we had this big space and we have a, a lovely staff member called Jim who has an awful trait. Uh, he can't help but collect things that he thinks he's going to use in the future. And so he, he this was his store area. So every year we have to get a skip in for his stuff. Uh, and we, we don't tell him, we just we give him a week off in that week. <laughs> and then we, we, we go about it. But so we had to do that. We do that, we had to do that almost annually here. So we thought, well, let's let's address Jim's problem by uh, building this um lean to. Um and again, we we got uh, we did this time this time we got a, a fencing firm in because it was rougher timber we needed, and uh, we attached it onto the wall which made it stable, it slopes towards here. That's not, that wasn't it finished. Slopes towards here, there's a rowing pipe, a, a guttering along the top and three barrels, because again, it gives us more space to collect the water. We're, we're very uh, self-sufficient. And um, I've put PVC sides on that as well now. Uh, and and it's fantastic. And we a clear corrugated roof. You've got all your daylight coming in. And I put a lot of the, on, on the PVC sides with this one, we put a lot of uh, see-through windows as well. And it's very flexible because you could have it with that front end open so that you're looking in or with the front, that big end closed down and one of the other uh, sides open. So that's your entry point. It depends where the wind's blowing, you see. And uh, we're going to be using this for, for a small bar area. So this will be our, our serving bar, not, not a sitting in bar, or anything like that, a serving bar. Whenever that time comes, I mean, we've got to be ready for that. So that's that's another wee space. Uh, and then of course we have our big dome. Now you see the wee sign at the, at the bottom there, which is about the one-way system. And the only, the only reason we operate a one-way system is, is because uh, you, you, if you get busy, all right, and we've never been busy enough for the one-way system to be really effective. But if you were busy and you had lots of people coming in, the one-way system keeps them from brushing by one another and getting too close to one another, you know? So that's why we, we uh, put that into place. And everybody follows it anyway, you know? But you know what? It, there's really not much space in our garden so that they're not really going very far to come back again, but at least they begin to think you know, there's a one-way system and we shouldn't be brushing brushing past people. And like I say, this is our, this is our prime meeting space that we've never really got to use yet. And then um, Joan from Trellis had a couple of people down for some, from a couple of groups. And we are absolutely open to people who want to come and visit us. No problem, we'll come down. We can even do a wee hospitality deal. Uh, but, you know, coming down and spend, just being in a structure like this is out of this world. Um, it's it's something you would find on a glamping site, uh, but it might not be quite as big as this. But it's lovely, uh, and like I say, that's only one side you see there. You know, so we can create that wee side there for like four people to sit, and then you know you can move it to the other side, and you can have another wee bit there. Look at that lovely view. You know, you can sit there and watch, look out the window, and just watch all of nature going by. You know, and doing what it does. Um, so this this is something we haven't really got to use to its effect but but over the winter we had lots of old, older people who were told they could only meet outdoors and you know they can't they couldn't spend much time outdoors so they were desperate for a place to meet so i said you know we'll actually open the garden for you and you can come in and you could have you know a wee group over there and a wee group over there so we did tea and scones and things like that for them and you know 20 quid we generated 20 quid from them you know to to come in which you know, it was two thirds of what I needed to open that day. So, you know, it, it kind of works for itself, you know. So operating procedures. If you're going to open your outdoor space uh, to the public, you, you should, you don't have to, but it's good practice to use track and trace for all visitors that come in. You can't make them do it. And you can't, you really, should, you wouldn't say to them, well, you're not coming in. If you don't do it, you know, you really want to encourage them to do it, though, for their own safety. So 
track and trace we do, and it's quite a simple system. They, they put it down at the end of the day, that goes into an envelope, gets sealed, put a date on it, and after a month, it gets burned. That's what we do, easy enough. Table service, so before we would have a cabin and they would come into the cabin and then we would, you know, give them a tea and a wee tray and a wee scone and that, and they would take that out. Well, no longer, we, what we do is, when once they are seated, we go out and say, can, is there anything I can get you? And then we get them, you know, their tea and of it and we bring them to them. And we've, we've got a mask and gloves on, whoever does that, that's them. If they choose not to do it, I can't make them do it. If I've got staff working and they choose not to do it, that's different. But generally speaking, we ask them to do that. So table service is much safer. And again, I ask the staff and volunteers that are working to wear a mask and gloves, but it's it's their call. That is their call. It's for their safety if they wear the mask and gloves. Um, fortunately, I think we we we've got when it, Jim's had his his job, so. But he's very, very, uh, he, he does wear a, a mask and gloves. He's very vigilant about that, as is Julie. So sanitizer stations, I mean, sanitizer at the start of the lockdown was was uh, harder to get than a, bo a good bottle of whiskey. Uh, now, you know, the, 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 brewery, the distilleries made the sanitizer and sold it to the government. <laughs> so there's hundreds of sanitizer going about. And we get a free supply of sanitizer from uh, our local distillery. Who gave it? Who gave their sanitizer out to community groups? If you're in an area with a local distillery, I'm quite sure they may have sanitizer that they can donate to you. And there's no shortage of it now, and, and you don't get through a lot of it anyway. Uh, again, so a, a group's been in your uh, social space, and they have finished, and you go and take their tea, coffee, scone away. Julie comes; she's out with a wee spray and a wee wipe down, and that's it. That's it done. It's ready for the next group. And again, let's say uh, this is this is the wee dodgy bit. So if you thought they weren't socially distanced, you would uh, uh, we would go out and say to them, you know, could you just adhere to social distancing? You can only ask them because one group may have a concern, but the other might not. So we go out. We would go out and engage with people and ask them that. Now. This is a very interesting thing. Um, we have always, I think for about the last seven years, we, our, one of our ethics is that we like to give things to people. So, you know, we, we've tried this, we've tried both things here. We've tried, because you've got to generate funds. So part of generating funds is some, sometimes you put a price on things. So if we were, for instance, uh, selling a bar of soap, Hand, some handmade soap, or somebody gives us some uh, jars of jam in or something like that. You, you know, you put, they, they need a price, you put a jar, a price on it, three quid or whatever, you know. But you know something, we found that we were, we were selling more things when we didn't put a price on it. So we would say, and say, how much is it? And say, well, how much do you want to give us? So, you know, we would say, we'll gift this to you and you can give us what you think would be an appropriate amount. And they it quite often puts people in the back foot because they don't know, they're embarrassed about what an appropriate amount might be. So then what you can say is, well, let's go for an agreed donation. And the agreed donation would be, you know, uh, two quid, you know, something like that. So there's a bar of soap there, it's, or it's three quid, you know. So, and they would say, oh, yeah, that's lovely, no problem. And that's it. And sometimes when they feel that they've got a wee bargain, just keep the change. Or just just put that in the box as well. So we actually generate more money by not having prices on things. You know, it's it's amazing, amazing. So just thought I'd share that with you. And I only picked up uh, the agreed donations phrase uh, this year. I've always liked the art of giving, but agreed donations, I love that, and it works. It's been going, going great since we've used that. So I, I urge that, you know. Now that, that's me coming to the end of my slide. That's one of the lovely continental days that we have in Girvan. <laughs> they're not that often, but when they are there, they're quite stunning. So I'm, I'm going to now uh, open it up to some of the questions and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That's lovely. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Lovely, we're going to hand over to Joan to voice any questions. Thanks. So I unmute myself, there we go. Um, okay, 
Chris, that was great. Um, I've actually visited um, Govan Community Garden several times now, and it's amazing what is there. And the, the slides probably don't show it. It's not a huge garden. It's not a huge space. But the spaces that you have created, you have really made every single space work in the area. And it's fabulous. Um, and I think you should get somebody with a drone up and take a couple of aerial views of it. Um, and the next time you're doing a presentation, I was just thinking when you were doing that there, it would be fabulous to have <laughs> a drone view of it. So um, great. If anybody's heading down to Garvin, definitely make a point of, of dropping in. So a um, few questions here for you. The one that everybody's asking um, is, where do you get the canvas sides from with the windows in it? OK, that's great. I've, um, for, I've been working with tented structures for probably about 25 years, you know, because I have another wee group that goes to festivals and hires structures to festivals. So I have a, a keen interest in portable type structures like that. I searched high, high and low through Scotland I, and I couldn't find anywhere that would custom make these sides for, for what we needed. Because, you know, not all of those stanchion points are the exact same width. So when you're measuring something like that up, you may get a side that's 150 centime 57 centimetres wide, but the next one might be 152. So um, with the best will in the world, you could say to the joiner, you know, make them all equal, but they'll just be slightly out. So when you're building something like that, you need it customised to exact sizes. So I managed to find a company in Northern Ireland called Cunningham Covers. Uh, so you can Google, if you Google them, you'll get... Uh, just Google in Cunningham covers, and up they come. And they were, they were. They, this company's been great. I've been probably working with them for maybe five or six years, and uh, they're not expensive, but they're not cheap. But then you want a quality product that's going to withstand the weather, so you need to buy a, a substantial grade of PVC. So, uh, and it's in their interest for you to buy a good quality product that lasts time, because then you're a statement to their future customers. So we we go to Cunningham Covers and we have an email, usually an email, an email dialogue, and then we have a phone call. But um, before they commit to anything, you know, for instance, anything that's 157 centimetres wide, it's all put on paper with drawings and they send it back to me. It's all part of the price. And then uh, once I agree that, the process is about two weeks and then it gets posted through to you. Now, they are absolutely, it's a fantastically flexible structure, a piece of canvas, or PVC, because they come with wee studs. And what you do is you attach the small studs onto the stanchion, and there's holes, like little uh, holes like that, that fit over the studs, and then the stud turns to keep it over the hole, you see. And it, it comes on and off very easily, and down at the bottom, there's a, a, a sort of space, like a sleeve about that size, and you can basically get uh, metal rods and shove them through the sleeve, and that weights it down as well to give it an even better tension. So I've, we've had 70 mile an hour winds, 80 mile an hour winds, and they're fine, you know. But if through the winter time, it would be better practice to roll them up and uh, keep them out of the way when you're not there, and then when you come in and you're, you're going to use it and you need a shelter space, you roll them down, fasten them on. You're only talking about a minute per side, you know? So it's very quick and efficient. But Cunningham covers, I'm sure there's also places in England uh, that do it. I, I don't think there's a place in Scotland. I've not come across one yet anyway. Uh, I prefer to keep my, the business at home, but Cunningham covers have given me such a good service that I go back to them and use them again. Great. Thank you. And I think you're spot on saying that you pay what you get. You know, you pay for what you get. And I think especially in the west coast of Scotland, well, the whole of Scotland and on the islands, wind is our friend. And we've got to work with her. And um, yeah, definitely. Can I just ask, 
Um, seeing the window part of the canvas side, can you get little, I know you've got windows, but you, can you get them that those little windows could open a bit like a caravan window or the old fashioned caravan windows that kind of tipped? You could, you could probably, you, you couldn't get them open, opening out like that, but you could potentially get them done in Velcro. Oh. I mean, Vel Velcro is so tough. Mm -hmm. There are some, there's, there's different grades of Velcro, but the, the industrial grade of Velcro will handle anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you you could get that window done in Velcro so that uh, you could roll that up mm -hmm. so the window was open, but the rest of the structure was closed. I, I find that the days when there's a day that there's been some days, you know, there's some days when you're up in the 70s, you know, temperature wise. And when you're up in the 70s and it, it's warm and, it get, and there's people about there and it's warm. You, you, when it comes to that day when you would open the window, you're as well to just open the entire side, you know, uh, because if you, that, that's, and you know, the Velcro, although it's good, it's going to begin to wear at some point, whereas the less, the less attachment or breathing bit of a, a PVC, so in other words, if you can get one big sheet of PVC, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to last longer. The minute you start cutting into it and doing things, it's going to last last less amount of time. So I mean, those those sides in that first the cabin extension, they're five years old. Yeah. You know, so they're 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 in great nick. How much? Sorry, sorry, no. I will get another question. No, no, I'm just fascinated by this subject. Um, how much were those sides for that first? Um... For the cabin, the cabin had. Uh, Three, three sides, three separate individual pieces on the left side and three separate individual pieces on the right side. And it was open. At the, I've now got it with another piece coming across, but it was open. So for those three sides there like that, it was about a thousand pounds. Hold on, I've got a delivery. <laughs> Okay, I'll just, um, those, the reason I'm asking more about those kind of sides is um, during some of our network meetings and things like that, that's one of the questions that always came up regularly. Sorry, that... sorry, sorry, I had a delivery there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, so yeah, about a thousand pounds, but uh, when we did the lean to at the top, uh, there was more sides and uh, a bit more of the PVC required and it went up to 1500. It's still pretty good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Okay, so we've now got lots of spaces that we can sit indoors with ventilation. Um, but tell me, somebody's interested to know, what about ventilation inside the biodome? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. Uh, when you have a structure like the dome, the dome is four metres high. So there's a massive circulation of air going on in there anyway. Now, the, the dome isn't sealed. So down at the bottom, it's built onto a wooden floor, and down at the bottom, the, the, the PVC comes over the edge of the floor, uh, and although it forms a weather seal, it's still breathing. So there's, there's still a, a trickle of air coming in at the bottom. And up at the top, there's three vents built in to the, P the PVC that allows an airflow as well. So even with the fire on, and uh, the, even with the fire on in the winter, it's pretty cold. Uh, so you need to be kind of, you know, we've, we've brought a, 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 a patio heater in for the other side now in the winter, but we're coming out of the winter. So generally what we do now is, you know, even, even just now when it goes to 10 degrees outside, you can sit, you don't need a fire in the dome. It becomes a wee heater, so you actually open up the door. So when, from some from now till about September, it's more beneficial to have the door open than closed because it gets too warm. Yeah. You know, so so that's the airflow. The airflow is underneath and uh, up above. Great. Okay. But it's still watertight. It's totally watertight. You see. Yeah. 
you've got to go and see this thing, folks. Definitely. Um, train from Glasgow down to Garvin. It's a lovely, a lovely drive, lovely journey. So go to Garvin and see firsthand. Okay, so we've now got the spaces. We've now got folk coming to have their teas and coffees. Jenny would like to know, you kind of touched on it, but Jenny would like to know, how do you actually keep folk in their bubbles? Do, uh, do you have their seating very well arranged? No, we find that people keep themselves in their bubbles. <laughs> uh, we don't have to do that. Um, if the instruction is good when they come in, uh, it's no, not a problem. So if they, remember, people are reluctant to go out into areas where there's other people. And that's what's causing some of the social isolation problems, that we're, and it's going to be even more. So we've got to encourage people back out as well. So when people are coming in, if they see track and trace, and then they've, they're, they're given a, a verbal chat about, you know, being in, if you want something to eat, if you want to do in, you can sit down in any of these wee spaces and we'll come and serve you. And, you know, if, if you just keep to your social bubble. But, you know, they can move about. In a, in a two meter, uh, you know, if they keep the two meter distance from anywhere, it doesn't matter where they go, you know, so long as they're keeping the two meter thing. But when they're all sitting down together, they are creating the social bubble. But they do it themselves. With the type of people we've got, we don't have to, we don't have to enforce anything. We just people just come in and they do, they do it because they're happy to be there. Yeah, that's great. But tell me, have you had to oust anybody? No, never, never. Excellent. You know, even even when we when we were pre-COVID, we we had event. We have this is this is really important. If you if you have too big an advert, you attract too big an audience. If your advert is the right size, and I mean that in a literal sense, if your advert's the right size, people have to come to you. If people find you, you've found the right people. So it's not about massive numbers. It's about the right numbers of the right people. And uh, we welcome everyone that comes in. We, we have had, in the past, we have problems with teenagers. So they come in, they say they want to see the frogs. They get down there and they want to throw bricks in the pond. So we just throw them out and we phone the police and we give them a report on who they were or what they were dressed like or whatever, you know. So that's what we do. But we've never had to do that with anyone uh, since, you know, in the COVID situation, uh, not through their social bubbles anyway. And you'll find that, you'll find that people will do it. And if they're not doing it, just give them a polite word. You know, just say, look, we, you need to, if you're going to be in here, you do need to adhere to the social bubble, you know. They'll, they'll take it on or they'll leave. Well, yeah, uh-huh. Jenny would also like to know, what are the details that you ask your visitors in the track and trace? What information are you storing? Very simple. Uh, now, if you have a group of, say, six people that come in, or, or say four just now, so from tomorrow, four people come in, and uh, we don't need all four of them to fill in a separate thing. One person is the point of contact for all four. So one person fills in name, address, telephone number, email. That's it. Whatever they can give us out of that, that goes in there. Again, they don't have they don't have to give you it, but we ask them to give us it for their safety and for everybody else's safety. So, and and that's what the government's asking you to do as well. So, uh, one like I say, just simple information, and we we've got a wee card, so we make a wee card up that says you know name, address, telephone number, and a number of people in your party. That's the other one, uh, because we want to know. You know, if that per can that person remember who was who they were with that day because they need to get in touch with them. Okay. And like Great. I say, destroyed after four weeks. Yeah. Good. Thanks. And um, sticking with your visitors, um, when they're buying your lovely scones and blueberry cake, um, do you have a card machine or is it still cash you're working with? Oh no, we don't. Have <laughs> no, we can't have a card machine. We've not got a phone line. We don't have internet. You know, we are we do have electricity, but we it, it's solar, and uh, it's not for main things. Like, well, we I suppose somewhere down the line we probably could do that, and I suppose going forward it may be something to look at. In fact, I'll just write that down. Uh, card machine because we have had a few people in that have 
went away because we didn't have a card machine. Um, and maybe that's something we need to do. But just now it's just cash and it's a cash donation. So it's not even a handling. There's a tin there. You know, I put it in there. Great. And keep the change. Oh, aye, the no nature. <laughs> I've only got a twenty pound note. Well, that'll be about twenty scones then. <laughs> okay, um, I'm trying to kind of lump your your kind of questions together. And Bori, jump back to the 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 social bubble spaces and the canvas. Any recommendations on colour of canvas to go for? Yeah, stay Any away from white. Okay. Yeah, stay away from white. White gets dirty. Uh, and it gets marked as well. So if you, there's some marks you can get on canvas, it doesn't come off. Um, the beige one is easy because I think that's their default canvas. Their, I think their default canvas is white and beige. So I just go beige, you know. White's too dirty. It gets too dirty. And uh, green is good, but it's dark. You see, so sometimes, you know, when you're creating an enclosed space, light is very important. So if you create an enclosed space and you've got big dark sides, you know, when it begins to fault and it gets to dusk kind of time, it's going to get dark much quicker. And what, what that also does is it stops the sun from trying to get through as well. So I would stay away from dark colored sides. And the other thing is they tend to put, sometimes they put a, a, a bigger price on colored sides. I mean, sure, it would look brilliant, wouldn't it? You know, like gold and red and green and, all these different coloured sides, you know, it get all psychedelic and that, but if it's going to cost you another 500 quid, it's not necessarily worth it. So we, we stick with beige down there because I think once you start with one colour, you really need to move through the garden with, it, with that colour, you know. Uh, the dome we got in green because we, we felt it, it needed to kind of blend in a bit more with the garden. And if you put, if that was in white, it, was, it, it would be white, green, or sand or something like that. And the other two colours we felt would have made it big and, you know, like um, bright, but we wanted it to, to melt in the garden a wee bit more. And in the middle of summer, it melts in beautifully because all your greenery begins to come out, you see? The, the leaves come on the trees and the willow and everything, and it just fits in perfect. Mm -hmm. So green, we have a big structure like that, but when you're coming to the sides, you know, green's possible, but I would stay away from dark colours and I would just go with the, the standard beige. I've never I've never really given it much thought, you know, other than white. Stay away from white. Okay, great. Good information. Thank you. Joe has asked, um, although COVID has not been a great thing for us all, has it created opportunities and generated new ways of working and given ideas for the garden that you probably wouldn't have been given a moment's consideration to? I have to say, I'm not happy with COVID. <laughs> we were going along towards self-sustainability with community events, and COVID's come along and completely pulled that rug from right under us. Uh, so we've had to adapt. If we wanted to open, we had to adapt. There's no choice in it. Um, what it's maybe done is it's made us focus a bit more on comfortable spaces. So sometimes we've been guilty in the past of having a community event that we've crammed people in because people want to be in. And I don't think that'll ever happen again. I think now what we'll be looking at is comfortable spaces. So how many people can we get in comfort comfortably so that they are comfortable in that situation. I don't think we'll ever, we've had 400 people in the garden before. I don't think we'll ever see those days again. Uh, but but we need to, we, we need, I think it's made us think, well, maybe we need to focus on more comfortable space at events and more regular events. So instead of having every now and again, a big event with 400 people, we need to maybe just change that way of thinking. I don't think it's a maybe, I think we have to. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're not happy. None of the directorship, none of the volunteers are happy with the situation at all, uh, but we understand it. And we, are, we, we cross our fingers and hope that somewhere down the line, we will go back to an event 
you know, that where we, we can bring in 250 to 300 now. I mean, I mean, I'll tell everybody here, we, over seven years, we've built our community events up to the point where I can sell a £10 ticket to get into the garden, to, to, to enjoy the day in the garden and have to, you know, sell out, you know, 300 people in a weekend. So it, it's, it's there, the self-sustainability option is there. And remember what I said earlier on, with the right people, you yeah. know, it, and that's that's important for us, you know. So you've touched on the self-sustainability road that you were kind of heading to. So I'm going to ask you to expand a little bit further for Kirsty, who would like to know how you're funded. Oh, right. Well, the reason I was doing the reason the reason I took the, and I have to say it's it's kind of my vision. This one, I. I did. I don't want to be around all the time, and I don't think it's good for an organisation for you to be around all the time. But you sometimes get trapped, and uh, I was hoping that maybe in four or five years' time I could come away from the directorship and uh, still be a volunteer, but not be involved in the business. And um, to do that, I seen the opportunity through self sustainability because we worked it out that £15,000 a year would cover wages and running costs. And if we could find a way to do that, then, you know, and it was seamless. So it wasn't like a big change. It was happening because we're generating more every year. Then eventually, when you step down, the model's all, it's all there. So, so it would be easy for someone to step into. They're not stepping into something that they have to create. It's already there. So that, that's what I was trying, we were all trying to work towards that. Um, now that we're not working towards that, it's a different ball game. I, I'm back to square one again. So I, I'm kind of back to thinking, right, so how do we generate 15,000 pounds? So the easy one for me, and I, I recommend this one to all uh, gardening groups out there, particularly if you're going to work with volunteers, is Awards for All. So Awards for All is a very straightforward form. And the beauty of it is you can use it again. So when you use it one year, you just keep it, right? Keep all the information. And it's just slight tweaking on, on the next year. And Awards for All are, are really, really keen to fund projects that involve volunteering. So volunteering is a key element there, not necessarily gardening. So if you could be volunteering in any type of project, and that seems to be a big key theme with them. So uh, that's we, we, what we do there is we make sure we've got, naturally we do rely on volunteers. So what we do is we have a greater focus on volunteers and what volunteers want from, from their time as volunteers. Uh, and we try and uh, sort of work towards that. So, that's what that's what gets to me. That's what gets the funding. You know what you don't want to do is go to a funding body and fail. It's just so it's soul destroying. So awards for all I find reasonably easy. And now that the big events are away, like the Commonwealth Games and the Olympic Games and all that, there's much more funding kicking about the lottery than there was before. So awards for all up to ten thousand pound, you can get a hundred percent funding. So I would say that that's, that's the number one for smaller, smaller groups. The minute you go to bigger projects, and my advice is to steer away from bigger projects, but if you do go to bigger projects, you're going to the big national lottery, right? Now, if you go to the big national lottery, then you, you really need, you need to do this. You need to build into it a project manager because as a voluntary group, you do not want to be doing that level of bureaucracy that's required for a bigger fund of money. So that, that's my personal feeling on it. Uh, and it's also my board's feeling because they know I'll, I'll be the one that does most of the paperwork. So you need a project manager if you're going into the National Lottery and you need to build that in. So you can go for £100,000 there, you know, for, for a three-year project, which is good because you're getting three years of security. Um, but... I think the awards for all ones are, are brilliant. So you, you could, for instance, if you wanted a volunteer coordinator for a year for so many hours per, uh, per week, you know, and in the winter it drops down a little, 
you know, then you could do that and have a small capital budget. So you could also say, oh, we want two and a half thousand pounds to build this extension so that, it, so that, and this is not entirely the truth, but so that volunteers have a place to go. You know, so they have a sheltered sp space to have their lunch or whatever, you know, so great, no problem. So that's what I would do. So uh, Awards for All would be my number one there. There are some other ones. If you live near a wind farm, some of the community uh, associations and community councils and things like that, they, they have they have like a, a, a third body, a third party body that, that uh, deals with applications to wind farm money. So wind farm monies are the same as, uh, they're, they're quite easy to get as well. It doesn't necessarily need to focus on volunteers then. Okay. Um, having visited the garden and having you spoken um, about your working relationships, you've got a great handle on like the awards and uh, like on funding, but you've also got a great take on developing working relationships. And just because you've mentioned like building your structures as a sort of way of building in the volunteering aspect to an application, can you just kind of briefly tell me a little bit more about the joiners fencing companies that you engage with to do the building work how did you get such a good price tell us a wee bit more about that relationship that you developed with them please so everybody knows someone <laughs> all right that's the bottom line here everyone knows someone and when you when you get a contractor that you don't know sometimes all right so if you get a contractor you don't know here's my question how often do they turn up you know they say they're going to be there one day at a certain time you know there's joe i don't know how long she had to wait for her bathroom <laughs> you know but you know i've had several people that are supposedly reliable in business firms and they don't turn up and when you have someone that you know can do something, you need to be able to see that they can do it. So you need to be able to see the work that they've done to know that they're good at what they do. And if you can see that in a practical sense, then you you really, and, and you're impressed by it, you would want that. And if they understand that you're a charity and that there's no one, no one in there makes money, you know, then they're doing good. They feel that they're doing good for the community. Now here's, here's one of the biggest selling points for me. If you have a website and one of your tabs on your website is our sponsors or partners, all right, and you then have a, a firm, for example, who want to give you, who, who want you, you have a firm that you think do a good job, give you a good product, and you approach them and say, can you give me a price, you know, and bear in mind I'm a charity and that, you know, and, and they do that, then the, the other wee bit is, well, we're going to stick a link. We're going to give a link to you guys on our website. And your website, because you're an ethical organization, shows then other people, this is, this is a good, reliable firm to work with. So potentially there's, a, there's, there's work down the line for these guys as well. You know, Because if somebody's looking for an electrician and we've got a link to an electrician on there who did a lot of work for us and was brilliant, then they, they, they at least they're 50% better off than someone they don't know that might not turn up. So that's another wee positive there. And again, you have to say, you know, because it's not a private job, you're a charity, you're a not-for-profit organisation, please bear that in mind. And if you can help us out, we'll pay you, you know, but make it make it reasonable. And, and if they're up for it and they're ethically minded and they know you, which is also important, you know, I'm 58 years old, I know a lot of people now, you know, I know a lot more people now than I did when I was 28 years old. So, you know, and when you gather that knowledge of people, people with skills, you can then approach them about, it's almost like a favour. Now, here's another thing we'll do for them. So if a guy comes in and it's just a wee job, you know, like I, I said, I need three battens along the top there, but I need you to do it so that it's exact. All right. And he would come in and I say, how much do you want for that? He goes, that's ah, fine. It's fine. I say, fine. So you get a, you and your wife will get a free ticket the next time we do an event, you know. And and they, oh, that, that that's great, you know. And then they don't need to buy a ticket, so it sells out, and they're on the guest list. 
you know, it's it's really really they, these are really important favors. <laughs> so uh, it, that's how we do that. Uh, and and but we we do use proper firms, you know, like we we do that as well. You know, uh, it's just trying to get the best value. And we've used a firm before, but they've ripped us off. And what you then do is you just say, right, pay it, but don't go back there. You know what I mean? But if you can get people that do that, and you, the secret is don't get a joiner who says, I, I'll build it for you. I've never done it before, but I'll build it for you. No, don't, don't touch it, because you'll end up spending more money uh, sorting it out. So you need to see someone that's built something similar and you, and you can see it in people's back gardens, you know. You see, so, who built, who but can I ask you who built that for you? Oh, such and such, right, okay, no problem. And then you can uh, approach them after that because see, I've, seen, I've seen this structure you built there. Could you meet me in the garden? I want to talk about a project, you know, and then they come down, you know. And then you can get a, a costing off them and then you go to the funder. Great, okay. Having an understanding of the behind the scenes of some of your events, I'd want to be on one of your guest lists. So I'll, I'll maybe come and um, do a floral arrangement for you or something. It's still raffle tickets for me. <laughs> okay, Govern Community Garden is very volunteer focused. Marion is interested in knowing, do you involve any adults or young people, school children with additional support needs? Uh, we, we do, we have a, a Tuesday, Tuesdays are a fixed green gym day and it's uh, ded totally dedicated to volunteers. So what you tend to have is uh, carers and their clients who come in and they're given a wee task that they do and they tend to find the task they like doing and ask to do that. So they come back to do those repeat, repeated tasks, which are fine because it gives us our maintenance. Um, and our volunteer coordinators are really skilled in working with that type of uh, yeah, that type of client and care group. As far as young people go, that's a different kettle of fish. We uh, we we quite often, if we work with a school, we quite often get the young people that are not engaging in that academically, and you then have people with a very low attention span who really don't want to be gardening at all. They, they're happy to be out of school, but they don't necessarily want to be gardening. So they become a handful. And unless you have staff that are totally skilled up to deal with them, you're not, you're not gonna, you're actually gonna put your staff off wanting to be in that position. Uh, because it's what you call in, the, in that uh, sphere, firefighting. You're trying to teach something, but at the same time, you're dealing with behaviors all the time. So it's not, in my eyes, that's not conducive. However, if the school was to allocate to you and you request people that are interested in gardening, who have the slightest interest in any kind of outdoor thing, you can potentially engage them no problem. And if you get them in and they get engaged, they become fantastic assets. So we've had, in, in my job, I've taken Four, four guys from a school 20 miles away and brought them down and taken them through a programme in the garden for the three years, you know, and they've turned out better guys and some of them went on to work in horticulture, you know, so, and they get great references as well, you see. So, yeah, I, I think there's, there's room there, but you, if you're dealing with schools, you have to be careful that schools just don't use you as an offload. You know, so there's somewhere for that group. <laughs> you know, and you have to be very careful with that, and you have to be very firm as a as an organisation because it can cause you more damage than help. Because if these if these if also you've got a nice hidden space and it's working well and it's very secure, and these guys get get wind of it, then potentially you know they're back there at the weekend over the fence. Now that's one thing I would say to you. A lot of people think that you can get really good free labour. And I'm not, I'm not shy about saying this, you can get good free labour from things like the community payback teams. You know, people doing, you know, like instead of going to, instead of doing fines and things like that, they do voluntary hours. But what I would say is you need to be very, very careful about things like that because you're introducing it to an element who may come back and steal from you. So you, you mustn't do that. My, my advice is don't do that. And we try in our county not to do that. 
So if if you've got payback teams, and I'm not saying anything bad about them as such, you you just play that risk, right? So you're better not to play the risk, and you're you're better to look for reliable volunteers that that you that you can work with. And I, I find certainly, and if you look from the trellis side, the therapeutic gardening side, so you have uh, people the, the carers and their clients. This is a great place for them. It's great because they're interacting together, you know, they're working one helps the other, you know, and you know, it's great. And and we get and you get your free maintenance out of it. So that's what we find. And if it becomes too taxing, then it's not worth doing. I don't care if it's funded, it's not worth doing. Yeah. Well, I think everyone will appreciate your honest observations because that that that's really helpful in itself. Really conscious of the time, um, but I know you've got loads to tell us about the garden, but I've got one last question um, for you. And the question is the 29th of March. We're interested to know what was your thinking behind reopening on that date in particular? Absolutely. So uh, from the 29th of March, you've got six people from two households. All right. So they can go to a public park. They can go anywhere outdoors and meet as that wee bubble of six, all right? So if you have a garden space, it's exactly the same as an outdoor park, all right? So it's what you've done is it's a private space, but it's open to the public. So if you then uh, open it up and you put those uh, principles in place like track and trace and social bubbles and social distancing and you operate that way you're fine because it's exactly the same as a public like if anyone lives in a city they, they there's a public park and there's a kiosk selling takeaway teas and coffees it's exactly the same so you can you can do that and you can only do it if it's an outdoor space though so uh, that's what we'll be doing from the 29th of March. We'll be opening again on a very gradual basis. So we'll be opening uh, Saturday, Sundays to get people back in again. And we know that there's people that want to come out. We have, like, like members telling you about the elderly client group who need somewhere to go and meet. Uh, and you still get cold days in March. And you still get cold days in April. You even get April showers. So uh, we know that they, they will they will need a, a place to come to, and that, that's what we're going to do. So and we, we were hopeful that things improve, and as things improve, we can get greater numbers. From the minute, from the minute that they open the beer gardens again, we're going to open a beer garden. So we, our garden's going to be a, an occasional occasional license licensed bar with hot food. Uh, up for up to maybe, uh, we were looking between 70 and 100 people in bubbles, all right? And we can do that as a beer garden. But we, because our, our community is desperate for something like that, you know, but, and it's even better if it's well, if it's well managed. And we, we have, we have access, quick access to someone with a portable license bar. Uh, we have volunteers that will come in and do the food, uh, and we have lots of people that we know will come back and be reliable. You know, people that just want to come in and, and enjoy that wee bit of time. It'll be a long time, I think, before we get back to event space and, you know, a bit of live music and things like that. But that will come in time. Of course it will. And I can't even ask answer this question because I'm struggling to remember where they actually are. Do you have toilet facilities at the garden? Oh, Not I, the oh, just I now. Toilet facilities. So the, the thing to remember here is if, you know, Joan's been to the garden, a few people maybe that are looking in here have been to the garden and quite a lot of people, I, I get a lot of aspirational people who want to start a community garden and they look at it and they go, fantastic, right? But it's not going to happen in year one. You know, what happens is different things happen each year as you grow and you develop. So the garden's 11 years old. So that's 11 years of development. And one of the first things we got in, and it cost 10,000 pounds, and that was 10 years ago. And that, honestly, 10,000 pounds is a lot of money for a toilet. <laughs> so it's a composting toilet. 
trying to remember the name of the company. Uh, state of the art stuff. So basically you dig a, a six to eight foot hole that's about six foot, six feet square and you eight, excavate eight feet down and you then pour concrete into a mould that creates two chutes that slide down to these two chambers. So it's two chambers. So the concrete mould forms two chambers and it slides down like a chute down to the bottom of the six, the six foot chamber on each side. And up at the top, uh, it's then concrete all the way up to the top. And at the top, there's two, there's four open squares. So there's four open squares and they have metal lids over them. And when you take this metal lid off here, you put a toilet pan on it. And basically you're, for the use of better language, doing your toilet down into the great big hole, all right? And you put some sawdust in. I've actually had people that wiped their bum once with the sawdust. <laughs> <laughs> so, you put the um, I wish I hadn't asked this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you put the sawdust down into there and remarkably, remarkably, it doesn't smell. And there's another wee kind of chimney pot thing that comes out of it and any potential smells go up through there. Now, there's also a urinal in there and uh, for the guys that use the urinal, it goes down into a wee pipe and it goes down and it soaks away to a, to a part of the garden, you know, and feeds it. So, um, and we only, uh, where it soaks away to, we only ever have flowers in there. So <laughs> uh, it's great, honestly, it's fantastic. And this is all underground. So you don't see any of this. Uh, and, it, and it's really quite a spacious uh, uh, compost and toilet. And the thing is, so we, after a year, usually, if we're not that busy- socially distance in there. <laughs> <laughs> so after a year, when it begins to go up and up and up, you know, the bit and below, it goes up and you think, oh, it's not going to be long before that gets to the top. <laughs> what you do is you take the pan off it, you put the metal sheet down over the top of that, and you lift the sheet off the bit next to it, and you've got a, a brand new six foot chamber, and you put the pan over that. And it, honestly, it takes an awful lot of stuff mm. to fill yeah. up. <laughs> then what you do is, after a year... After a year, the two the two hatches at the front of where the two hatches are for the pans, the two hatches at the front, you lift one of them off and you get one of these great wide shovels and you go down and when it comes out, you've got brilliant compost. But again, we only use that on the flowers and shrubs. So that goes around all the garden into the flowers and shrubs. Fantastic. So when we talk about um, uh, an ethically... A self sustainable space, you have a, your compost and toilet, you have your solar panels to generate electricity, and you're collecting your reservoirs of water. You know, so you, you could actually do this anywhere. Yeah. See, as, as long as you know, you could do it anywhere, you could do it in the middle of nowhere and, be, and, and actually be able to run with these facilities. The card machine and the internet thing are a wee bit different. So uh, I've not quite looked into that yet because I do think I need a phone machine to get the broadband, to get the different things that you need to operate the card machine. You definitely need a telephone line. Yeah. I'll have a wee look at that though. Yeah, there was a, I'll share, there was a, a comment made in the chat. I'll, I'll share that with you later on, Chris. But really, I'm sorry, we're going to have to stop you there because your stories are incredibly interesting. The the chat is all about um, how refreshing you've been and great passion, wealth of knowledge, um, and definitely Trellis will be booking you up for uh, another study tour as soon as we are able to um, get a group of people back down, down to you. And I think it will be sold out um, and the art of giving will be rattled. Um, thank you very much, Chris. I'm going to hand back over to Jenny. Um, so thank you very much. Can I just say, uh, just before I go there, that um, we are, if there's any groups out there and they want to learn from us uh, and, and even teach us, <laughs> uh, then we, we, we're open. We're open to people coming to visit us. We love it. It's great. And we, we're, we're looking at a thing now called green tourism. So, you know, that like 
instead of trying to attract tourists into a town to you know go and eat fish and chips and walk about the harbour and do that, come and learn about uh, gardening and upcycling and recycling and all the different things that you can do. Come and learn about all that while we have a cup of tea and potentially something stronger. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> That's brilliant. Lots, lots and lots of fantastic comments there. Somebody's asking you to write a book <laughs> about it. <laughs> That's lovely. So um, I'd just uh, like you to um, put your hands together. If you can hover over your reactions, we can give uh, we can give Chris a big round of applause there. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris, for sharing all those insights. Um, lots of people saying that's absolutely inspiring and they're away off to uh, open up their garden. To the public come the end of the month that's great thank you very much so um i'd like to thank all of you who have donated to trellis already if you haven't and you've enjoyed today's session please consider making a donation to the trellis to trellis to support future work and also think about donating to chris's project as well we'll, we'll um, put his link in a follow-up email for you um, you may be interested in our plastic free gardening book offer it's on offer this week, don't miss it. The link is in the chat now. So I'd like to bring this session to a close. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. We look forward to seeing you um, later in the week. There are still sessions to, that you can sign up for today and tomorrow. And I'm going to leave you with a link to our feedback survey in the chat. We really appreciate it if you can take just a few minutes to complete it. Um, and because we're really interested to see if these sessions influence your therapeutic gardening practice. So thank you very much and goodbye from all the Trellis team and goodbye from Chris. Cheers.